Julia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank tonight. you, Kyle. Great to be here. Yeah, super excited to to get chatting. So a lot to talk about, a lot to to pack in tonight. Um, but before we do that, uh, you know, at, at Heterox Academy, we're we're big on thinking wholly about people and about who we're talking to. And you know, it's not always cool in higher ed to talk about our personal interests and likes and loves and things you like to get to business. But I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself, your intellectual loves and passions. How did you find your way to the conversations that you're having today? Yeah, I've always been a, a bit of a dilettante. So I have a wide variety of seemingly unrelated intellectual passions. Um, but definitely a common theme um, over the years that eventually led to the book um, and that like I hope is apparent in my podcast is my interest in epistemic rationality, which is uh, a term for basically the study of how to reason better, um, what kinds of heuristics for reasoning um, lead to reliably more accurate beliefs in, in a domain general way across all possible subjects or topics. It's a very kind of general approach to how to think. And it has to do with philosophy. Um, you know, what does it mean to have accurate beliefs? Uh, and it has to do with psychology, uh, understanding how the human brain actually does work um, so that we can understand how to close the, the gap between the actual and the ideal. Mm. Um, so that's, that's definitely a defining interest of mine. Uh, I'd say I'm also very interested in epistemic, or sorry, in um, effective altruism, which is uh, a movement devoted to figuring out basically to applying epistemic rationality to the specific question of how do we do the most good um, in the world uh, on a very general level, like across all possible species, not just humans, um, across all geographic locations, across time. You know, how do we how do we have the highest impact on people living in the future and not just not just today and animals mm -hmm. in the future and not just animals today, et cetera. Um, so I'm very passionate about that. And if those sound dry, I also have some more personal interests like uh, uh, time travel and puzzle games. Um, my brother and I are working on a, a time travel board game at the moment. So I've been thinking a lot about game design and um, how to like instantiate time travel in a game so that it can actually feel like you're you know, going through a time loop and uh, making meaningful choices that affect the outcome. I guess that's also kind of nerdy, but I'm sorry. That's like the least nerdy interest I can think of at the moment. So that is fantastic, though, and I definitely want in on that when you when you publish it. You know, it's so funny you you went went to game boards because um or board games because my I wanted to drill down a bit on what it was like to be interested in a topic that suddenly becomes so salient uh, during a pandemic mm. when we're all thinking about how we're thinking and how we're digesting content and talking to others. And yeah, I mean, you've been thinking about these ideas for a long time. Um, and they went to board games, which is what a lot of us were doing. <laughs> we were home and yeah, not no, you know. <laughs> Tabletop simulator has just was a godsend during the pandemic for me yeah. and Jesse, my brother. Uh, we were on tabletop sim, you know, multiple times a week yeah. playing games and then designing our own games. So uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. There's, there's many like examples of technology that I felt grateful for during uh, during COVID, but tabletop yeah. simulator is up there. That's up there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll bookmark for a moment. I want to come back to sort of how, how the pandemic was, you know, if, if your writing is a stream, the pandemic is this gigantic boulder that gets landed in it, you know, how, <laughs> how, did, how did the water sort of move around? We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, we have a big audience and, you know, I'd, I'd like to assume we all have read the scout mindset and if you haven't, please go read it now. But, um, for the benefit of those who who haven't yet, uh, you know, it, the book has drawn attention for so many great reasons, uh, not the least of which is your focus on how we're thinking is impacted by our feeling. Uh, could you offer just a brief summary for those who haven't had a chance to pick up the book yet? What's your elevator pitch and and give us uh, give us the the, the, the spirit of, of the text itself? Yeah, so one of the core ideas of the book is that being smart and knowledgeable and and good at reasoning uh, and constructing arguments is not sufficient for being able to see the world clearly. Mm. Um, in addition to your intelligence and your cleverness, you also need the right motivation directing your thinking. Um, so, you know, you could be brilliant and, and knowledgeable and clever, but motivated to use all of that brilliance to defend things that you already believe or, or want to believe. Um, against 
any evidence that might threaten them. And a lot of people are very good at that. Uh, you're, I'm sure people are familiar with the trope of um, the guy online who's memorized the entire list of cognitive biases and logical fallacies uh, and just uses that knowledge as like a cudgel to beat his opponent over the head with and, you know, point out all the flaws in other people's reasoning and never notice any flaws in his own reasoning. Yeah. So that's one type of motivation. Another type of motivation uh, is the motivation to actually figure out what's true to the best of your abilities. Um, and look for evidence on both sides uh, that might disconfirm something you believe in addition to supporting it um, and be motivated to change your mind if the evidence warrants it and uh, just be curious about what's actually true. And so uh, I have a framing metaphor for the book where I call those two mindsets, soldier mindset and scout mindset. Um, mm -hmm. The official terms for those two modes in cognitive science would be directionally motivated cognition for soldier mindset and accuracy motivated cognition for scout mindset. Um, but I like the metaphor. I like using metaphors. Um, yeah. And I think it, there's kind of a nice parallel between the soldier and the scout because the soldier's job is to, you know, defend a fortress or defend their side against attack. Um, and the scout's job is to go out and see what's really out there as clearly as possible. And, you know, form as accurate a map of a situation or an issue as possible. And, and mm -hmm. to like draw the map in pencil figuratively speaking, with the understanding that it's going to change as you learn more. Um, and sure. that, that's good that you're not, you know, suffering a defeat, you're making your map more accurate. Yeah, yeah. So one of the big trends on, on college campuses, and not just there, but but in the nation is, is free inquiry, free speech, um, you know, openness, uh, talking across lines of difference, and really sort of counter to being prey to your own limitations. However, what's interesting in the book, and even in your description here is, you're noting connections and sort of sort of um, dovetails between soldier and scout, and you don't entirely trash soldier as as this you know anti and, and you know an antithetical component to scout. Could you speak for a moment in what might sound kind of countercultural to the counterculture right now about the benefits of the soldier mindset that we 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 don't necessarily need to walk around hating ourselves for being the way we are, right? Yeah. So I I really did try to to understand what the purpose of soldier mindset is. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very easy to say, oh, humans are irrational. You know, we, we, we do all these irrational things and that's terrible. We should try to be rational instead. Um, right. But I think uh, a rule I try to follow is that if you're going to propose that people do something different or that, you know, we, we change some institution or some custom, you should try to make sure that you understand what the purpose of that institution or practice or custom was in the first place to make sure that you're, you know, not getting rid of something valuable. Um, mm. And so uh, I think soldier mindset serves a lot of purposes, but to to just condense it all into a, a short soundbite, um, mm. soldier mindset serves the purpose of helping us feel good and look good. And so on the feeling good side, that includes things like, you know, comforting ourselves if things in our life aren't going entirely the way we want. Uh, we, we might use soldier mindset to try to defend narratives in which we're actually the victim or, or you know, the hero um, mm -hmm. and the problems that we're having are not our fault or they're, you know, it's actually a sign of virtue instead of, you know, bad luck, things like that. Um, we might use scout mindset to help us feel motivated to do really hard things. Like if you're starting a company and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and you're risking a lot and you're working really hard, it can be really tempting to make yourself feel better about your your odds of success by you know downplaying any evidence that suggests that your plan might fail or you know dismissing people who are skeptical or things like that um so that's feeling good and then on the side of looking good often we use soldier soldier mindset and again i should emphasize we're using soldier mindset unconsciously like we don't think okay i'm going to deceive myself in order to feel better or look good um yeah. but i'm kind of speaking at the level of of the purpose that this unconscious practice is serving in our brains mm -hmm. um so to look good, we'll often deceive ourselves into believing something that maybe we don't have good reason to believe because holding that belief makes us look good. Um, it makes us look wise or, um, or compassionate or um, like we're part of the right team, it makes us look like loyal tribe members to hold the beliefs that our, you know, our peers and our, um, our coworkers and family hold. Um, or we might kind of play down disconfirming evidence because it helps us appear more confident in our beliefs. And we, you know, implicitly feel like 
expressing our beliefs with confidence is going to make us seem like charismatic leaders. Um, it's going to make us seem like we really know what we're talking about. People are going to want to listen to us and, you know, hire us and, and, you know, right. pay attention to us and mate with us and things like that. So there are all these purposes that soldier mindset can serve. Um, I'll just like flag for the moment that I think uh, soldier mindset has a lot of downsides and that there are usually ways to get those good things to, to look good and feel good without resorting to soldier mindset. And so that was a big part of what my book was about. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, I'm just, my mind is just buzzing right now with, with my own experiences during the pandemic and uh, just being on social media throughout the pandemic, especially 2020, when we all first kind of went back home and started to look at ourselves in the mirrors a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to hear what your experience was in terms of where you were in the writing process as of, you know, throughout 2020. And as you watch the pandemic unfold, where did you see the scout and the and the soldier mindset at work? And you know, I'm thinking about things like um, this wide spectrum for the vaccine debate, for instance, and why people sort of arrived at the conclusions that they did um, mm -hmm. or continue to. What was the pandemic experience for you as the author of, of this? So the writing was basically done by 2020. Um, but of course, I, I look at things through this lens, uh, even if I'm not in the middle of writing the book. And so uh, I, I did see a lot of soldier mindset uh, in, in the early days of the pandemic. And since then, um, there are, uh, I, can, I can mostly speak about the people who I kind of follow on social media and who are like in my circle, um, mm -hmm. most of whom are not, you know, uh, diehard Trump fans and things like that. So I'm, I'm talking more about soldier mindset in my like corner of the world, um, which is not to say that they're the only people who ever exhibit soldier mindset, but uh, you know, there were a bunch of people who kind of uh, arrogantly and overconfidently uh, expressed a view about what was going on early on. For example, you know, it's ridiculous to worry about a pandemic. This is something that, you know, uh, nerds and techies worry about because they're, I forget what the insult was, uh, I guess, I don't know. They're disconnected from real problems or they're they're doomsayers or something anyway so there, there were very overconfident statements early on um that this was not worth worrying about and anyone who did worry about it had something wrong with them um and then there were very overconfident statements about you know masks don't work um if you uh, if you're wearing a mask you're being an idiot uh, and then mm -hmm. there were very overconfident statements later about you know masks definitely work and anyway so <laughs> the the trend is that you know there's some clusters of people who will, you know, go all in and on whatever the current consensus is, you know, regardless of how justified it is. Um, on the flip side, I did see a, a minority, but you know, an important minority of people um, really trying hard to figure out what was going on and doing their own research in what seemed to be a, me to be a pretty truth seeking way um, and, you know, publishing their their like take each week and making predictions and noticing when they got things wrong and saying like, oh, this prediction of mine was really overconfident and here's why. Uh, a journalist named Kelsey Piper at Vox uh, who writes for the Future Perfect section did a nice kind of post-mortem on what she got wrong about COVID. I did an episode with her actually where we go into more detail about, you know, how she was approaching the problem, how she was thinking about things, what she got wrong. Um, for example, she thinks that she dramatically underestimated the importance of being outdoors as opposed to indoors, and um, if we talk about why that happened. So, you know, there were a number of people online who I think were being very careful and self-reflective, and I just tried to like mostly pay attention to them and not get too angry about the first group. Right, right, right. Yeah, you say something interesting there about, about uh, we all on some level create our own echo chambers, but uh, mm -hmm. doing the work of making sure that we're not, we're not resting in those too much, right? And getting out of them. I think a lot of people during the pandemic sort of, uh, either leaned harder into their echo chambers or became more self-aware of them as we were shocked week by week with new news and, and new, uh, new information to digest. Um, mm -hmm. And amidst all of that, uh, which was a time of, of just, it continues to be confusion. Uh, you know, confusion is something that your book pushes as a virtue almost, as something that can be really productive, leaning mm -hmm. into confusion. Um, could you 
talk for a few minutes about the the, the benefits of confusion, maybe maybe in an, in an ideal universe, and then uh, what does it look like to lean into confusion personally during such confusing times mm -hmm. when there's so much at stake uh, racially and uh, you know medically and institutionally. Yeah, so when I say lean into confusion, I'm just referring to the fact that uh, we're constantly getting disconfirming evidence from the universe. Um, things happen in ways we didn't quite expect, or we encounter something that contradicts our, our narrative or expectations. Um, and the impulse that we have is to make everything make sense, to find a reason to dismiss the you know disconfirming evidence. Um, and this is very understandable. Like if we were constantly uh, questioning and revisiting our basic assumptions about the world, we'd never get anything done. So sure. it makes sense that we kind of try to shoehorn what we're experiencing into our pre-existing narratives. Um, but I would argue we take it too far and that we you know, end up blind to, to really strong disconfirming evidence that piles up um, long after we should have noticed like, hey, there's something wrong here. And mm. so when I say lean into our confusion, I mean, uh, try to be on the lookout for things that don't match your expectations or your narrative and pay special attention to those instead of trying to kind of smooth them over or paper over them. Yeah, so yeah. an example, well, I guess a, a COVID example, since we're on that topic is, um, so one of my little like hobby horses is that I wish that the US had done human challenge trials earlier in the pandemic. So uh, let people volunteer to infect themselves with COVID so that we can test uh, uh, treatments and vaccines on them uh, and and get our, those helpful drugs much faster, thanks to the you know noble uh, sacrifice of these volunteers. Yeah. Um, and so it was you know frustrating to me that the U.S. didn't do this, and and I had this narrative in my mind that this was you know the U.S. is such a risk averse risk averse country um, and. Like we've, we've gotten really risk averse over the years, and this is why we're not willing to, you know, incur this, this like small in the grand scheme of things, risk or cost for the benefit of, of the masses. And so that was my narrative. And then a kind of confusing challenge to that narrative is that, well, other countries don't seem to be doing human challenge trials either. I think the UK eventually did them earlier this year, um, but much later than they should have. And then I don't think any other countries did them at all. And so that is a confusing observation. If my narrative about, you know, the US wasn't doing them because of these factors specific to the US, um, that kind of contradict, like, that's not what you would expect to see if my narrative were right. And so right. I kind of noticed that at some point, I was like, oh, that is interesting. I like, maybe my model of the US is wrong, or maybe my model of uh, just human psychology in general is wrong or something, because that maybe shouldn't be the the explanation yeah um a different example actually is if i think i think a lot of people felt like the us was kind of uniquely bungling its response to the pandemic and it was easy to point to things that the us was doing wrong um but i think a confusing observation uh relative to that model is just that a lot of countries seemed to similarly or like to bungle their responses in similar or different ways. Um, and, you know, they might've been bungling it in different ways, but like, it's hard to square that with a model in which the US is kind of uniquely bad. And so I think people paying attention should have been confused about that. Yeah, that yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna drill down a little bit for, for a minute here and uh, not, not exactly push back, but complicate. So, human beings are stubborn. Our nature is stubborn, right? It, it takes us a long time to change. And the, the science out there about things like positive thinking and growth mindset is still, is still unsettled. How in your estimation does a, you know, we have a room full of faculty and, and a lot of faculty and, and people on, on college campuses and who have students under their purview and they're modeling learning processes for the students and trying to teach your students how to do things well. Mm -hmm. How, how, how do you really foster that scout mindset? How do you get to a point where your reaction to confusion, when your processes start up, 
uh, isn't to immediately become the soldier and pull the sword out, but is to become the scout and take that take that step forward, especially if there's fear involved, you know, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you suggest people begin to coach themselves to do that differently? So one technique, I almost hesitate to call it a technique because it might sound stupidly simple or something. <laughs> um, but but it's it's not it's not instinctive and automatic, and I think it's quite useful. So I'm gonna talk about it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that that initial reaction that we have almost unconsciously uh, when we encounter disagreement or an observation that contradicts our narrative or something, that initial reaction of like, no, I can't be wrong. I have Mm -hmm. to find a way to dismiss that. Um, Often all it takes is just to second guess that reaction and just poke at it. Like, do I have to be right about this? Like Mm -hmm. what actually happens if I'm wrong about this? Um, and so, so this is like a mental tick almost for me at this point, uh, that I do. And that a lot of people I know do, um, Mm -hmm. when in that initial moment, when you find yourself reacting against, uh, some disagreement or disconfirming evidence to just ask like, okay, suppose I was wrong about this. How bad would that be? Like, what would that actually mean? Uh, what would I do about it? Mm -hmm. So if you're having a disagreement on Twitter or something, uh, and someone makes a point that. I'll just speak in the first person because this happens to me. So if someone makes a point that causes me to go, oh, shoot, I'm not sure I have a good rejoinder to that. Whoa, what if he is actually right about that? The My impulse is to push that aside and immediately look for ways I can win the argument. But yeah. if I stop and go like, okay, what happens if he actually is right about this? How bad is that? Um, I quickly notice this, it, it's fine. Like I've said I was wrong before. People were generally appreciative. Nothing much happened. Um, <laughs> sure. It's fine. <laughs> um, and yeah. even for more consequential things like, shoot, what if I was wrong about, you know, this new uh, this new product that I argued in my company we should be launching and, you know, I'm starting to get nervous that I might be wrong about that. I'm tempted to, you know, push those doubts aside or double down. Um, mm-hmm. How bad would it be? Like, maybe it would be a little tough. Maybe it would be a little awkward. But even just coming up with a basic plan of like, okay, here's how I would tell my team or here's how I would you know, do my best to fix the damage, just like having a basic plan can make it feel much less, can make you feel much less like you have to uh, make the truth be a certain thing Yeah. Um, that you yeah. could be okay with either possibility. Yeah. Um, this is really just a, a variation on a, a very common thing that they teach you to do in therapy, which is that uh, when there's something you're worried about or afraid of, to just ask like, okay, suppose that did happen, how bad would that be? And what mm. would I do? And very often the result when you've actually thought about it, instead of just flinging away from thinking about it, is like, okay, I could handle that. That would that would be okay. And then the fear kind of dissipates. Yeah. Um, that's that's a really powerful message, particularly for the 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 majority of the audience at the Heterox Academy, which is sort of education and higher ed. I'm thinking about the fact that in my own experiences and and for other scholars out there. When you are when you are an expert in your field and your craft and you're in an environment like a college campus or, or your disciplinary conventions where you are known for 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 your 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 acumen and your experience, being wrong can be additionally scary. It, it, it can be uh, it can be uh, a threat to everything you're standing for and the profile you built for yourself. Um, and so to hear from you that a quick tick to, 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 to think about what could this actually mean in the moment? Can I get comfortable being wrong even in the moment? Um, and then more so, more so beyond that too, just recognize in other, in other sort of fields, what you're describing sounds like intellectual humility as well to recognize, you know what, might not be right about everything here, but knowing that can help strengthen actually, um, ultimately my grasp over what I do know and what it is that, that I, can, I can speak and speak well about, right? Can I just comment on that phrase, intellectual humility? Please, absolutely. This is another like uh, happy horse of mine. Yeah. So it, it's not wrong. It's, it's not a bad phrase or anything. But the fact that we use the word humility to talk about, you know, being uncertain when the evidence warrants being uncertain is kind of weird to me. And I feel counterproductive um, because it's kind of conflating appropriate uncertainty about the facts with a kind of social um uh, obsequiousness or or you know performative weakness or something like that uh and you know one of 
the motivations behind the book for me was that I saw a lot of people kind of resisting the idea of scout mindset, like people who in theory were like, yeah, yeah, you'd be being truth seeking is good, you know, paying attention to the evidence is good, but they were still kind of reluctant to, to like be better scouts. And one of the reasons was that they had this association that, you know, recognizing uncertainty and acknowledging when you were wrong is kind of a sign of weakness. Mm. Um, and so phrases like intellectual epistemic humility or um, admitting that you were wrong um, or that you made a mistake, I feel like kind of play into that. And I, you know, in the last 10, 15 years have come to know all of these people who are so like intellectually humble in the way you're talking about, but they, they don't come across as humble at all when you're just talking to them. Like they come across as very confident, uh, even while they're saying that they were wrong they come across as confident. And mm -hmm. so I, I kind of, I kind of wanted to break that in my opinion, unjustified association people have between uh, epistemic, like proper uncertainty and social weakness. Cause I, yeah. I think it doesn't have to be that, that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think you do. I think that that move does a service both to helping individuals cope and manage and, and get over uncertainty and also does a service to the word humility itself that that doesn't have to mean social weakness right that that as you just said you can be humble and confident at the same time yeah. in, in conversation and that that's a particularly good message again for those individuals in higher ed who are um feeling the pressure to always have to profile a certain way um in front of class in front of colleagues so that's that's fascinating yeah yeah there's a anecdote I tell in the book about a friend of mine who uh, he's talking to a friend of his and and his friend said, you know, you never you never admit you're wrong about anything. And my friend Andrew was like, what? I no, I do all the time. In fact, here's two examples I can think of where I admitted I was wrong in your presence, like in the last month. <laughs> and his friend said, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. Why did I have the impression that you never admit you're wrong? And the friend thought and then said, you know, I think it's because you you don't seem at all sheepish. You're just like, oh, yep, never mind. I was wrong about that. And it doesn't register as you, you know, admitting fault. <laughs> and so, you know, this is, I guess, another way of answering your earlier question about how do you make yourself emotionally comfortable with being wrong? And I think finding ways to project confidence while talking about uncertainty or changing your mind is a big part of it. Because I, yeah. in my experience, that is one of the main stumbling, block, uh, stumbling blocks for people. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. So this really moves us into uh, a, a different, uh, slightly connected topic I want to I want to share with you, which is emotion generally. I mean, uh, although emotion can can really muddy our thinking, it can be part of what triggers that soldier mindset. You also talk about the emotional rewards of the scout mindset that it's yeah. not just an intellectual thing for you. So what what are those? What advice do you have for listeners as thinkers to take up a healthy relationship with, with our emotions um, and, and as, as they relate to the scout mindset. I'm curious to hear you talk about that. Yeah, so kind of as I was getting at earlier, I think people have this implicit assumption that recognize, like being truth-seeking and objective will involve recognizing uncertainty and doubt and you're just gonna be kind of paralyzed and stressed out by you know the messiness of reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that can happen, um, but there are these kind of compensating emotional benefits that uh, that I feel and that a lot of the best scouts I know seem to feel. And so I kind of wanted to shine a light on those and, and say, you know, actually this can be really emotionally rewarding. Um, you know, look at these examples. And so one example is I think, uh, well, we, when we were talking about confidence, you know, yeah. a lot of people when they feel they have to project more certainty than they actually feel, that's a very stressful and um, uh, uncomfortable emotional state to be in. Like if I, if I feel like I have to convince someone of something that I maybe can't fully defend, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm pushing them, I'm, I have to apply pressure uh, and anything, if they sort of notice the weaknesses in my argument, then everything will come crashing down and I'm kind of on edge. It's not a good emotional state to be in. Whereas if I've kind of committed to just making arguments that I feel I can defend and kind of flagging the epistemic status of my claims. Like, you know, here's the thing I am quite confident in. Here's another piece of the argument that I think is less clear. And so I wouldn't be shocked if it was wrong. Uh, yeah. If I've committed to doing that, it's just so relaxing. Like <laughs> I can just say what I think is true. 
Yeah. And, you know, if someone points out a flaw, I can be like, oh, yes, I agree that like that is a reason this could n turn out to be, uh, you know, not not the way I'm predicting. Um, and it's just very freeing. Um, and I guess another example would be uh, thinking in grayscale is a kind of key piece of what I'm calling scout mindset, where you have different levels of confidence for different beliefs. And mm. if you're kind of thinking in black and white, then any evidence you encounter that contradicts your model is a dire threat to the whole edifice. And so you're kind of forced to find a way to, uh, to, to knock it down or evade it. Um, but if you're thinking in grayscale, then, you know, if you think that immigration is good for the country and you encounter a study that seems to show that it's I don't know, bad for the wages of native workers or something, that doesn't have to be a threat to the whole edifice of your belief. That study should maybe like reduce your confidence in your belief by 10% or something like that. And mm -hmm. those are much more kind of relaxing moves to make than the, uh, you know, defend my belief or lose the entire thing. Yeah. So I think this kind of, I think this kind of accounts for why a lot of the best scouts I know seem so Zen, <laughs> um, even <laughs> though they're letting in much more uncertainty and doubt than the average person would. Mm -hmm. What does it, what does it look like to, and I want to, I want to shift into higher ed just a little bit and get your thoughts on a lot of the culture wars happening there, but mm -hmm. what does it look like to have a scout mindset and also hold firm beliefs, maybe ones that aren't necessarily evidentiary basis based. I'm thinking about strong religious beliefs or strong philosophical approaches to, to the world, um, either in your research or in your conversations with scouts, what is it like mentally to sort of hold those two things together in, in your mind when something you believe might not be something that the world can threaten or shake, mm. um, you know, what, what is that? What is that? I, I think I, I, you, there's two ways I approach that question. What is it like to talk to someone like that? <laughs> um, but, but also what is it like to, to be some of those kinds of beliefs and also practice the scout mindset? So I do think people can compartmentalize to some degree. Um, I know people who, who are religious and are not, at least my impression is that they're not treating their religion as kind of an empirical thing that could be disproven in theory by evidence. They are, right. they're approaching it as a matter of faith. And yet they are pretty good scouts in other dimensions, like impressively so. Uh, this, I guess I would count this as kind of a confusing observation. It, it was confusing to me. This is not what I expected. And I still don't know quite what to make of it. Um, but in fact, it looks like humans can often compartmentalize and just kind of like, apply scout mindset to some do domains and not to others. Yeah. Um, I think like it, one way to get at your question is to say that people often ask me, how do you like, you can't just question everything, right? You can't be constantly <laughs> right. wondering if you're wrong about every single belief, right? So how do you choose? Yeah. Um, and that's true. There are some beliefs that I, I'd just be so shocked if they were wrong. Like in theory, I could construct a hypothetical experience I could have that would convince me that I'm, you know, wrong to uh, care about alleviating suffering or something that could convince me that I'm wrong about, you know, to, to trust scientists about the basics of gravity or evolution or things like that. That could yeah. happen. It just seems pretty unlikely at that point. <laughs> sure. Those beliefs are, um, they're pretty like central to my network of beliefs. And so I don't spend that much time questioning those. Um, yeah. So the, the heuristics that I use are basically if, uh, well, if there are like smart and reasonable people who I would have expected to agree with me about a belief and they don't, um, and I can't immediately see something that they're missing, then mm -hmm. that should be like a flag telling me like, this is a belief that might be worth questioning or poking at more, even if it seems to you right now, like it's clearly true. Um, beliefs that are really high stakes where like I'm taking actions, you know, I'm investing a lot of time and effort into like based on that belief, um, like effective altruism, for example, there's some premises that are maybe not quite as basic as like suffering is bad. We should try to reduce suffering. Um, but, uh, like, uh, I don't know that like people in the future 
don't count for less just because they're in the future. Um, there's some kind of moral premises like that. And, uh, and, and we're like making decisions about how to spend our time and money based on those premises. And so those, I think that's another flag indicating that you should like invest more time and effort than the norm into questioning those beliefs. Yeah. Um, and then of course, like anything where you get confusing observations from the world where you're like, if I was right about this, then this would be a very surprising thing to observe. That's obviously another red flag. So, huh. so, you know, that's true of many beliefs, but then there's also going to be some pretty foundational beliefs that like, you can pretty safely leave those uh, unquestioned unless something radical changes. Right, right. Yeah, it really, that really uh, points to, to one of these core uh, articulations we make about the point of the university in college mm -hmm. that, that uh, seeking after truth, seeking after, after knowledge is, is important for so many reasons, individual reasons, but also generally, like we, we can point to things and say, this is probably fundamentally sound probably fundamentally reliable and continuing to articulate those as, as um, successive generations of students and scholars experience the world, I think, I think matters. Um, speaking to campus for, for uh, a few minutes here, there are just a constellation of issues that we're seeing on campus these days, self-censorship, which mm -hmm. strikes me as a version of the soldier mindset where you're, you're um, opting to stay quieter, to not attract attention and to sort of protect. So um, technically, by my definition at least, uh, you could be a scout and self-censoring uh, if you're at least internally aware that I disagree with the consensus, but for whatever reason, strategically, I'm not going to say that. So I'm just defining a soldier and scout mindset uh, with reference to your own belief forming process, uh, yeah. and not, not with reference to what you tell other people. So you could sure. be a scout and then just lie to the whole world. That's like, <laughs> right, right, right. So that, I mean, beautiful. That's actually kind of where I wanted to go. So, so I mean, sort of the huge complicated versions question is sort of how would you map scout and soldier onto self-censorship, canceling, trolling, um, mm -hmm. all these things we're seeing, seeing on campus. And you've kind of started, started to answer that. So, I mean, Obviously, you are you are a cultural omnivore. You're watching this happen across the, you know the, the nation. Um, mm -hmm. What have you been your have What have been your thoughts about higher ed? I mean, that someone can be a scout and lie uh, about it uh, is is fascinating observation. Um, on some level, even that lying, you must be cutting out something right from from the, that could be possible data and experience for you, but. Um, if, if that's possible, then one of your messages to campus can't just be, be a better scout. There's something more there past psychology and into interactions with one another. So what would you be saying to students on campus who are struggling with this kind of thing or faculty in a department where they're feeling alone? Yeah, so I guess I could approach this question from the direction of talking to people who are doing the self-censorship or pressuring people for censorship and cancellation, or I could, I could approach it from the perspective of, of the people who feel increasingly silenced or, you know, like Probably. they don't have space to think in their own minds. Yeah. That would um, be, I mean, I'd love to hear both, but I think that, yeah. that latter would be really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So <sighs> there's no easy solution. I think, um, I think it does help if, if you, I agree with you that it is a good thing to to be clear when you disagree with a consensus. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't have that, then we you know get into these belief spirals where you know some views are considered acceptable and you just assume that those are the you know universally accepted because no one disagrees with them and then it becomes even more heretical to disagree with them because it seems like they're universally accepted, et cetera. And I think those are really dangerous and toxic spirals to get into. So I think people are doing a good thing when they express disagreement with a consensus, as long as it's a good faith disagreement and not, you know, trolling. Uh, Scott Alexander, who writes, well, I guess it's now called Astral Codex 10, used to be called Slate Star Codex. He has a great post about how if you, uh, if you express disagreement with deeply held beliefs that other people have in a trolly way, you're kind of, you're kind of like spending down this valuable commons that we have of trust in each other and you mm. make it all the harder for other people who genuinely do disagree in good faith to be you know taken seriously when they express their disagreement so um mm. so don't troll but like do express disagreement to the extent that you feel 
like you can. I'm not going to harangue people and tell them they have a moral obligation to because it can be scary or dangerous, or maybe you don't feel like you're in a position in your life where you can afford that. Um, and I get all that, but I think it's, um, I think it's a noble thing to do if you are willing to do it. And I think there are things you can do to make that go better. Um, I, when I, I, I don't talk about controversial things that often. When I do, I try to be very careful and measured in my language. Uh, I try to, I like bend over backward to try to avoid straw manning the other side. Um, I'll often like explain the reasoning behind my conclusion instead of just saying the conclusion, um, which can be like, I think that's often a thing that soldiers do uh, is just like wave the, the belief like a flag or wear it like a badge right. instead of kind of trying to show the process that they were following to get to that belief. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically to sum all this up, I think there are a number of honest signals that you can give of good faith disagreement. Um, and if you build up a track record of giving those honest signals, mm -hmm. I think you're less likely to have people, you know, react to you like, oh, you're just a traitor to the cause or, oh, you're just a, a troll and things like that. It's not a silver bullet. <laughs> you can still, uh, you can still make people mad, but I think you can like yeah. mitigate a lot of the damage if you have a track record of, you know, being a genuine scout about controversial things. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so great. I mean, I, be having a track record suggests on some level building relationship with people around you and sometimes that can be track record can be in writing or it can be in, in publications and things it doesn't have to be interpersonal but uh, i love that idea that this is not just something that we practice tomorrow in an incident although we can but also over time something that can get here that we can learn to do we can learn to do better um, yeah and i see people misusing this sometimes like mm -hmm. i'll see people style themselves as champions of the truth and and talk about how they they really just want the truth they aren't they aren't part of a tribe they aren't trying to you know attack the other side they're just in search of the truth but in practice if you actually look at their track record they only seem to be interested in complaining about particular issues on like one side of the political divide or yeah. you know i never really see them sharing any evidence that that goes against their narrative. And mm -hmm. so I think people are very sensitive to that. They're kind of hyper on the lookout for signs that you're actually arguing in bad faith. Yeah. Um, they're on a hair trigger for that already. So it doesn't take much to convince people that you're right. not arguing in good faith. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so I, I think it has to be an honest signal. You have to actually, uh, you know, want the right answer, whatever it may turn out to be, instead of wanting to use that as a fig leaf to, you know, complain about the people that annoy you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 cry now for free inquiry, open inquiry, all these things is not just make the culture change around me. It's it's practices of, of habits, right, of, yeah. of mind over time that that make a difference. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. I love to keep talking to you forever, and we can for, for a little while longer here. We have a couple questions, lots of questions, um, and to give them ample time, I think that we will shift to those and and keep uh, keep dialoguing through them. So a uh, couple questions here. Can a firm defense of the scout mindset itself be a form of soldier mindset? That's a great question. So in, one should be a scout about scout mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, uh, it is entirely possible that scout mindset uh, could make you less happy or less successful or could make people see you as you know weaker or... Uh, you know, less competent or things like that. That's all entirely possible. Um, it's also theoretically possible that trying to pursue the truth doesn't actually work that well. This would be a weirder world uh, to exist, but it could be that, yeah, when when humans try to pursue the truth through reasoning, they're just really bad at it. And so they end up, you know, even more wrong than they were before. Um, mm -hmm. All of that is totally possible. Um, I, so the claim that I make in my book is not that scout mindset is always the better approach or you know you're always better off having an accurate picture of yourself or your prospects etc so i don't think i can defend that and uh, in fact there are a number of people kind of in my camp talking about intellectual honesty and and mm -hmm. uh truth seeking who i think do overstate their case like i read this i think it was bertrand russell in I forget which book it was, but anyway, he, he was talking about self-deception and he said, you are always better off uh, knowing the truth 
and figuring out how to deal with it than deceiving yourself. And I read that and I was like, how do you know? <laughs> like, yeah. that, <laughs> right. I can, I can easily construct examples where it seems like someone, you know, would be worse off knowing the truth. And, uh, and it just seems like it de depends on, on like empirical factors. Like how good are you at coping with you know, unpleasant things. How yeah. likely is it that you can fix the problem that you've forced yourself to face? Um, how good are humans at ignoring problems and just being happy? Like, I think mm -hmm. Bertrand Russell kind of had this model where like, you can never truly be happy if you are lying to yourself, um, but maybe we can, that's an empirical question. <laughs> anyway, so so the claim I make in my book is, is a narrower one, and it's one that I feel more confident defending, um, which is that we should expect that on the margin, we would be better off with more scout mindset and less soldier mindset. Um, and I have some arguments for this. Uh, mm. One argument is an evolutionary argument that I think the world in which we evolved was much, it, it rewarded soldier mindset more than today's world uh, does. And that today's world re rewards scout mindset more than the evolutionary environment does. And so we should just expect a priori that our brains are not optimized for the current world and that whatever mix of scout and soldier minds that we have in our brains is probably unbalanced in the direction of the soldier. Um, I have a few other arguments too, yeah. but, but so I think that's like a more careful claim. Um, and it could be wrong, but like I lay out my arguments and you can see what you think. Yeah. And, um, and then beyond that, a lot of my arguments in the book are, are carefully not like science proves that this scout mindset technique works. Like, you know, the thing I mentioned earlier about, Actually, you'll, you might notice that if you just ask yourself, do I have to be right about this thing? You might find a lot of the defensiveness kind of melt away as you notice, like, actually, it would be fine if I was wrong about this. Mm -hmm. I'm not claiming science proves that. I don't really think we have good evidence on that. But I, yeah. I do feel confident saying, like, I find this helpful. A lot of people I know find this helpful. Uh, it's pretty low cost to try. You could try it yourself and see if you find it helpful. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a whole other tangent, but it does really annoy me that there are a lot of books out there uh, like nonfiction books about society or psychology that I think really like overplay their hand when it comes to the science proves thing. And like, if you actually look at the studies they're citing and they're just like really weak, shoddy studies about, you know, that either like didn't replicate or were just like poorly designed yeah. and they're about one like really specific experiment. And then the author is using them to make this general claim about human nature. Um, and so I, I did try to err on the other direction and not, <laughs> act like I was making a bunch of like scientifically proven claims because um, I don't think that we can do that about almost anything in the like social science realm. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting to hear. Uh, one, one pattern I'm hearing through a lot of your, your, your discussion here is a word that isn't so hot in the culture right now, but reasonableness, mm -hmm. uh, just being self-aware, self-aware of how you're coming off, uh, of how you're thinking, where your blind spots are, and uh, ensuring that the scout mindset does not itself become, become an idol. Um, in, yeah, in it's especially world. hard, uh, I think, for me, because I'm out there like talking about the scout mindset and, mm -hmm. you know, talking about how great it is. Uh, and that like anytime there's a belief you're you're touting to other people, especially publicly, and, mm -hmm. and especially if you're like staking a lot of your you know reputation or career on that belief, um, <laughs> it becomes uh, all the harder to notice evidence that it might not be you know, as sound as it seemed. So sure. I, I do have to kind of like bend over backwards and, and notice like, well, actually, what would happen if, <laughs> uh, like to apply my own technique to myself, what would happen if it turned out that, you know, uh, some piece of my model was wrong, that like people are, uh, I think it would be hard to like get really good evidence about this, but, you know, there could be specific examples where, you know, scout mindset wasn't actually helpful. How mm -hmm. bad would that be? I don't know. I think it'd probably be fine. Like, I think, most intellectuals out there have been wrong about things and right <laughs> you know, their careers didn't tank and i think i could i could acknowledge the point and people would still respect me and it would be okay but yeah. i do have to keep reminding myself of that because that that's not my initial impulse sure sure you're you're a great example of a scholar who's absolutely modeling what you're arguing now and writing about i mean well, it's people will tell me if i'm not so <laughs> <laughs> right there you go there you they go. will let me know yeah yeah, yeah. oh that's funny um so, so sort of keeping on this 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 sort of interpersonal topic we're on right now, another question uh, came in here. When conversing with others who seem to be adopting a soldier mindset, uh, have you found any ways of encouraging a shift in them towards a scout mindset, but without falling into the trap of becoming a soldier yourself in your efforts to 
to sort of shift them over. Wait, sorry, is the questioner saying that I seem to be taking a soldier mindset? No, no, I think it's a more general sort of, maybe I think the question seems to be sort of when conversing with others, you seem to be adopting a soldier mindset. Uh, maybe it's a question of have you specifically found ways of encouraging a sh encouraging the shift towards scout mindset you know without falling into the trap of of getting defensive ourselves and maybe also a general question how would you encourage people to when with when with an interlocutor who's not in good faith or is defensive or being a soldier how do you reasonably graciously work with somebody um to help shift them over especially if there's somebody in your work life that you can't avoid right mm -hmm. can't not work with um yeah what what is what is what is that work yeah so i definitely think you have to lead by example uh, mm -hmm. uh you know you, you have to express the right level of uncertainty in your claims and you have to uh point out reasons that your view could be wrong um instead of just waiting for the other person to bring it up and hoping they don't um and i think you have to be very precise about your claims um, like, because people, people will instinctively want to make a specific narrow disagreement, a referendum on some much bigger culture war issue. And mm -hmm. so I think you have to like work hard to, to fight that tide and say, you know, like, that's a good example. Um, uh, like, of course, I'm not saying that like the, de the Democrats are terrible, or of course I'm not, I, I'm not a fan of Trump or something. But like on this particular issue, I wonder if like the Democrats were wrong or like on this particular, like, so you have to kind of work hard to separate the specific thing you're talking about from the broader issues that everyone's going to want to polarize on. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I think you just like, you have to recognize that this is not an easy thing and just be more patient with hmm. people when they are bad at it in annoying ways I and mean, i'm talking to myself here like i you know i do have to keep reminding myself when people seem like they're being overconfident or arrogant or unreasonable like the human brain just seems to work this way and i can't i can't really blame people for this of like this is how we're wired and also i do this too to some extent uh and so like recognizing that makes it i think much easier to move on and just not uh get riled up when people are being unreasonable yeah um, yeah and then just you know sometimes you just shouldn't be having conversations with that person <laughs> like i recognize that sometimes in life you can't avoid it they're your coworker, or your you know sure. in your social group or something but a lot of the time you can avoid it and i see people you know getting into these really enraging disagreements online with someone who's you know not going to change their mind and they're not going to learn something useful from uh, and they just get really riled up and i think it's not just bad for your you know, mental or emotional health, it's also kind of bad for your ability to cultivate scout mindset as well, because people tend to, I think people tend to benchmark against the people they're around. And yeah. so if you're like, yeah. well, you know, all these other people are complete soldiers and like, I'm amazing compared to them. Uh, or, or there's kind of like a tit for tat thing that people do instinctively where, the, where they're like, why should I try to understand the other side when the people around me aren't trying at all? Mm -hmm. um and i think it's good for you to try to understand the other side just independently of how other people are being but it sort of doesn't feel that way in the moment it feels like you know i shouldn't have to do this if other people aren't doing this well maybe you should be surrounding yourself with better people <laughs> right 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 so yeah back to your point about, about being patient and recognizing your context um i've also been in 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 conversation sometimes you know you know a conversation with friction with somebody who is mm -hmm. reasonable and uh and very open in some conversational topics or some areas of their lives and not others and mm -hmm. part of the realization of being patient with a person and with myself is oh this particular topic must be hitting something so i'm curious have you thought what what you're thinking has been on a, a person's ability back to compartmentalizing to be a really great scout in this area and a terrible scout in that area, mm -hmm. um, being more of a soldier, you know, to what extent can we, can we be, be both? Um, and just thinking about that in terms of talking with somebody else and recognizing, huh, this is a, this is a tough topic for this person. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I think partly whether we're more scout like or soldier like depends on, uh, how, how connected the topic is to our identities. Um, mm -hmm. like, is this a topic that we've 
been defending publicly um, or, or not? Is this a topic that, you know, feels like a referendum on whether my tribe is, you know, good and virtuous mm -hmm. and wise or not? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, uh, I think whether we have incentives to try to see things clearly is another big determinant. It's kind of complicated, so I don't talk about this that much in my book because um, it's very messy. But you know, there's some uh, issues where our th ability to thrive depends on whether we get the right answer. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, m I might have an incentive to be a scout about things relating to my personal health um, and whether I need to like get a second opinion from a doctor uh, or you know just go with the first diagnosis. Or more mundane examples would include. Um, Am I going to like, when do I need to leave the apartment to catch the train to get to my appointment on time? These are things where like, I get rewarded if I get the right answer and I get yeah. punished if I don't. Um, and then there are other things like politics where we don't really have a personal incentive to get the right answer. And so uh, it's much easier for people to slip into soldier mindset about those things because there are soldier incentives, uh, like the ability to feel good or look good or fit in with your tribe, and there aren't really compensating scout incentives. Um, and then there's some things that are kind of in the middle where there's competing scout and soldier incentives. I think the example I gave of of your own personal health is kind of a good example because, you know, yes, I have a strong incentive to like get the right answer about my health so that I can, you know, survive and like take the right treatment and so on. But I also feel this strong incentive towards soldier mindset because confronting something unpleasant about my health might be really painful and stressful. And so at least in the short term, that's a disincentive to get the truth. So um, so anyway, I think factors like this can explain a lot of the compartmentalization um, yeah. where people might be really good at scout mindset in one area and not so good in, in another area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, again, a great reminder to think through what are we talking about? Why are we talking about it? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the broader, the broader context? Yeah. Um, another, another great question here. Uh, hi, thanks for your ideas. I'm curious how your reasoning and decision-making structure works on a macro level. For example, is a group willing to follow someone who is uncertain or adjust their knowledge set based on frequent changes of vetted information? Think in, in short, do scout mindsets make for great leadership? Um, and what's your, what have your observations been about that lately? Well, so one example I talk about a lot in the book is Jeff Bezos, who I'm not going to claim he's a scout in every single way because no one is, but, uh, but in a few particular ways, at least, I think he's a, a pretty good example uh, of scout mindset. So uh, in particular, when Bezos was first deciding to start the company that would become Amazon, he tried to take a really hard objective look at his odds of success and decided, you know, I think I have about a 30% chance of success, which is a number he got to by taking what seemed to be the baseline for success for internet companies, which was like 10% in his estimation, and then adjusting upwards because he felt like his idea was unusually good and he was pretty talented, yeah. but still 30% yeah. is less than 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just very clear about this uncertainty to all of his early investors, to all of his employees, to the media. Uh, he told all of his investors, like, I think there's a 70% chance you'll lose your money. So don't invest if you, you know, can't afford to fail. Um, he told all of his employees, like, you know, at some point, Amazon's probably going to fail. Because if you look at the base rate, like, you know, big companies do tend to fail after uh, mm -hmm. after a few decades, at least. Um, and he told the media, like, there are all these early interviews where he keep, keeps emphasizing what we're doing is very complicated. We can't guarantee success. Um, here are the things that we're doing that I think give us a good shot at success, but you know, it's hard to predict. If you mm -hmm. looked back in the eighties at the uh, you know, tech companies then, I don't think anyone did a good job of predicting which ones would be successful. And so that, that applies today to the class of companies, including Amazon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I think Bezos does a great job of expressing uncertainty when it's warranted. Still, he clearly is a, like a very effective leader. He's very good at getting people to invest in him and you know, work for him and cover him in the media and buy from him and things like that. Uh, and a large part of that, I think, is the distinction I was talking about earlier between um, epistemic confidence and social confidence. Mm -hmm. Like, even when Jeff Bezos has low epistemic confidence, like in the future of his company, he still has lots of social confidence and he expresses his views, you know, clearly and forcefully and uh, with good body language. And he's got a lot of energy. These are all things that his early investors commented on. Um, and he also, I think, is good at 
explaining the reason for his uncertainty. So he's not just saying like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. He's saying like, look, here's why I think you should be uncertain about the future of Amazon. And if anyone tells you differently, like they're kind of bullshitting you. Like that's the undertone. <laughs> right, um, right. So yes, I think uh, scouts can be very effective leaders, but I think you, you like have to pair the epistemic uncertainty and so on with other important things like social confidence and, you know, the ability to sort of like stand by your reasoning, even if the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where in leadership, I know we're kind of shifting focus a little bit, but where in leadership is a soldier mindset a really good thing? And that's not a begging question. I'm just curious as, as we talk to the start of our conversation about mm -hmm. the, the way these two things, not balance, but, but um, play, play out. Uh, well, in, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I mean, it would be helpful if like, there are some audiences that are just less, uh, have a less realistic view of uncertainty than others. And, you know, mm -hmm. some people seem to think, well, you should be able to be 100% certain in your views or your, you know, company success. And if you're not, then, th then something's wrong. Um, a lot of people, I think, do recognize that like, actually that's really unrealistic to have 100% certainty. And so I don't trust someone who has 100% certainty. Yeah. It's interesting, I didn't really cover this in the book, but the research on how the public reacts to uncertainty from experts mm. is very bimodal. So there's, in all the studies that I can remember, there, there's always one sort of significant minority, like 30 to 40% of people who react to uncertainty by saying, well, I trust the experts less now because if, if the scientists say they're uncertain, well, then they just don't know what they're talking about. But there's also always one significant minority of people, you know, 40 to 50% who say like, yes, they like, of course they're uncertain. Like reality is messy. We don't have all the answers. If they claimed to know for sure, then I wouldn't trust that. Yeah. So I think it's easy to fixate on the first category and be like, oh, people don't want to hear uncertainty. Um, no, the, the more accurate answer is some people don't want to hear uncertainty. So to get back to the question, if your audience is more like the former group, then maybe you would be better as a, as a soldier. Um, yeah. Also, I think if you're in an adversarial environment, mm -hmm. um, like politics, where uh, people have an incentive to, you know, find reasons to, to shoot you down or make you look bad, then at least outwardly admitting uncertainty um, could, could be detrimental to you. I think in, you can still like acknowledge uncertainty internally for the purposes of, of your decision making um, mm -hmm. and just like pretend to be more certain than you actually are. And that might be the best strategy uh, in some contexts. So, oh, and then I guess the last thing I would say for when it would be better to be a soldier is if you just can't, like I lay out all these ways in which I think you can have your cake and eat it too. You can like recognize uncertainty and change your mind and uh, et cetera, while still looking and feeling good. But I don't know for sure that everyone can do that. Like right. maybe it's just really hard for some people and they, you know, the strategies that work for some people don't seem to work for them. And so they will just be really depressed and unmotivated if they allow themselves to face the truth that like, I might well fail. And like, you know, people don't think my jokes are funny or whatever. <laughs> um, for those people, maybe soldier mindset would be better. Um, I just mainly want to make sure that people recognize, you know, here's some alternates that I think would be better and that are worth trying, but I don't think I can claim that they will definitely work for everyone. Right. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Again, reasonableness, right? What's, uh, where, where, where are people's, uh, positionality and how does it work for them there? Yeah, it's great. One, one last question here, uh, which I'd, I'd, I'd love, love to hear, um, you're thinking on. So the late Donald Broadbent experimental psychologist, uh, epitomized the scout mindset. He was patient and kind and, the most substantial intellect that this questioner ever encountered. What other academic, they specify psychologists or philosophers, have you encountered that displayed this rare but invaluable mindset? Um, and I'll add as a caveat, I love would love to hear, of course, anybody public that you could point to as a model, but also love to hear your story. You know, who who have you seen do this well? Mm. Well, uh, there's a number of academics that I really respect on this score. Um, I was just interviewing Phil Tetlock uh, for as a guest host of the Ezra Klein show, mm -hmm. and you know his work is all about forecasting and um, and how the world would be better if we you know used forecasting more instead of just pundits giving their opinions, um, and what can we learn about how to be better forecasters. Uh, but I admire that he is not, you know, dogmatic about forecasting, 
I've seen him be very good about recognizing its limitations and what we still don't know about it. Um, mm. And, you know, the potential downsides of being a good forecaster and things like that. Yeah. Uh, random one, but Saul Perlmutter, the, the physicist who, who won the, um, the Nobel Prize a few years ago for the, you know, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe um, is a really good scout. I don't know if this is like apparent to the world, um, but it's apparent in person at least. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, he, I think I wrote about this in the book. Um, he had this admirable example that I loved of trying to not fool himself in his research um, hmm. on the expansion of the universe, where like he, he was very aware of the, the issue or the phenomenon where um, uh, researchers can unintentionally get the answer they were hoping to get by just through all the little decisions they make about how to, how to analyze the data, yeah. unconsciously picking ways to analyze it that get them the answer they were hoping for. And mm. so he kind of blinded himself and his uh, uh, colleagues by removing the identifying information from their data set so that they had to do the analyses not knowing uh, essentially like what the data meant mm. um, and, and like commit to an, al an analysis without knowing which side it would support. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I admire that. It kind of like shows through in his, in his personality. Um, I'm sure there are many more, but those are, those are two examples. Yeah. A lot of no. people I admire, I think, aren't actually academics. They're, you know, journalists or bloggers or people who mm -hmm. just the way they talk on Twitter um, or the blog posts that they write uh, really exemplify scout mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, I mean, here's another whole rabbit hole we cannot go down tonight, but um, the benefits of exemplifying this kind of characteristic on social media specifically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a place, a place that that just seems to absolutely uh, enforce the soldier mindset at every turn. Um, and finding ways to practice that publicly where it's needed most, I think is, is a scary proposition for some people, but we need that. We need people in these, in these spaces modeling how to do this well, um, because people are watching, right? Like you said, we are fine tuned to whether something is in good faith or not. Um, mm -hmm. more, more of that's essential, I think. Yeah. And I think people really can, to some degree, curate their own online experience. And it, it's easy to like fall into the trap of getting sucked into these very frustrating disagreements and, you know, complaining that everyone online is unreasonable, but right. you, like you could with a little more effort, you know, unfollow the people who are trolls and are, you know, making you mad at the world and selectively follow people who are more reasonable and, you know, raise points that you hadn't considered and acknowledge when they're wrong and so on. And I think, you know, you'd probably be not only happier, but like a better thinker for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Julie, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for- My pleasure. Talking across so many categories. I mean, there's so much, so much to think about. Um, I I have some more questions, but we need we need to not go down more rabbit holes. Uh, best of you luck. You can tweet at me. Yeah, we can tweet, right? Yeah. Tweet at you. yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, well, thanks again. Uh, thank you. Our community is one that is uh, just so earnest and and desiring to practice a lot of these things more. So thank you for for sharing not only practical, uh, not only sort of theoretical how you came to these ideas and how you're thinking about real good practical solutions for how to how to be better together. I think that that really matters um, to be thinking along both both axes. So thank you for that. That's been great. Thank you. I'm a big fan. Great. Well, uh, be well. Happy holidays and see you.